morning, everyone. So the class today is just going to take where we ended off yesterday. We were starting to look at some estimates for costing. And we're going to take that further now and look at how we start to do some fairly more detailed costing than at least the example was that we started off with yesterday. So let's put this into context. Any project that runs for a period of time with significant capital investment uh, will have a typical cash flow diagram that proceeds as follows. So the project gets started at some time zero, and then some initial investigation and ideas into uh, how we might do this project. So there's a small amount of money spent, and there's more detailed engineering and drawings done, and and estimates. So this is the period of time where you're estimating what's going on. And then you start purchasing this equipment. There's a lot of money spent to purchase that equipment, get it installed, um, and, and get it started. There's a very sharp drop here, um, which we call working capital. That's where you start to pump in things like catalysts and buy your raw materials to get started. And then you start producing product, and this will go up. And the trajectory that it goes up with, either this way or this way or more linear, is, is very dependent on uh, the situation. So we, that's, uh, that's the part that we're going to talk about after this. What we're talking about here is this initial section. What are these costs that go in initially? What are those capital costs that go in? Right? The money flowing in afterwards and the salaries that you pay and the labor and the utilities we're going to get to next. What we're focusing on is this initial section of uh, capital cost estimation. So over the next uh, uh, two classes or so, we'll be looking at that. So just a, a, just a quick interjection here. On Friday, remember, is uh, Dr. Adams is going to be here talking about the course project. So we will finish this material today on cost estimation and we'll resume it again on Tuesday. But Friday's class is important. Uh, to be here, so that you get to hear what the project is about and see. Um, we are giving a lot of insight into how the flow sheet was, was assembled. So uh, let's, let's make sure we're here on Friday for that. So come back to the capital cost. We we're essentially estimating that first bullet point, that fixed equipment. Working capital is that smaller amount down here, which is, like I said, the initial purchase of catalysts and materials and supplies to get started. Uh, but we're estimating capital costs. And the reason why we want that is uh, so that we know how much money we need to go ask our investors for, or our parent company, or so forth. We also use these estimates that we're going to talk about next to screen alternatives. So there might be three or four different ways of getting to the same product that we want to use. Which one might be a more economical way to do it? We ended off uh, yesterday's class with this uh, very crude calculation um, for the estimate of that fixed capital. So we said that if we know what we can get for our product, and that's usually fairly easy to determine what their gross annual sales amount is, we can go look at historical data for that and look at our competitors that might already exist in this area. What are they earning on a dollar, uh, on a per kilogram or a per ton basis? And we can multiply it by our size that we plan to build for and get a crude estimate of what that fixed capital cost is. We said that that turnover ratio is a number that's around, around 0.5. So let's just take a look at a quick example on how you should use this. Um, I've added the errors down here, and that's what I want to focus on. And errors are between minus 50 and plus 100. So when you're using this turnover ratio, the way to report your result is not to just report the number, but report the bound instead. So for example, if we had sales of, of 5 million, then my capital cost estimate is going to be 5 million divided by 5, so 10 million is my fixed capital cost estimate. But we don't report 10 million to our boss. What we rather say is, well, we're going to expect a value of between 5 million and 20 million. So we don't report the 10 million, we report the range instead. 
with that error included. So there's a, a lower bound of minus 50% and an upper bound of 100% on that point as So that's how we use this, um, those error bounds. So if you were thinking of this in, in the context of someone, say, opening a restaurant or a cafe or something like that, they could go and find out quite easily what other cafes are earning. Right? Those, those sorts of numbers are often shared amongst, amongst the industry. Right? So it might sound unusual, but it's true. If you're opening a cafe or restaurant, other cafe owners and restaurants are pretty comfortable telling you what their sales are. It's not a big, big thing for them. And so you can go and estimate what the fixed capital costs are is, provided you know what TR is for that industry. Okay, so TR for the chemical industry is 0.5, but other industries, those turnover ratios are, are quite different. So it's how fast can you turn around your capital costs into sales. It's going to take two years of sales to just make back your capital cost amount. Is, is true on average for the chemical industry. Here's another one that we use. Um, before we go into this, please make sure your notes are corrected. Um, I realized that I had that LF factor, the Lang factor, on the wrong side of the equal sign. It should be on this side, on the left side. So please make sure that that's corrected. <coughs> Found that mistake this morning. So that's going to be wrong in pretty much everyone's printed version. Okay, and this, this is an important, the importance of this slide is more to emphasize why these values down here are so large. Like we're going to talk about this 4, 4.35. What it says is that if we know what it costs to have our equipment delivered to us, that's fairly straightforward to find out again. We can get a quotation and, uh, and get the delivery cost, include that. There you've got your cost of the equipment delivered. But that's not what it's going to cost you at the end to get it into your site, installed, and operated. In fact, depending on the nature of your industry, it's going to cost you between four and five times that amount to actually operate. That's phenomenal increase. Right? So an equipment that may, may have cost $100,000 delivered is going to cost five times, so half a million dollars, um, but once you're all set and done. Okay? So, what do, we, what do we mean by that? So here's delivered cost. So there's an example of a titanium plant reactor about, I think it was five meters in diameter and 25 meters long. So that's the delivered cost to get that little guy moved over to your site. Finally, you've got to hook up all sorts of utilities and piping to those ports. Uh, there's a whole lot of instrumentation and so forth that takes place. And that's going to then land up to be your total fixed capital cost. So here's a different system, flotation cells now in, in this instance. But when we get the fixed capital cost for one of those tanks, and let's say there's about 50 of them in this, in this facility, that's our, we can sum all those up and get our summed delivery cost. But that's not our fixed capital cost. Our fixed capital cost is getting it all in. Okay, so we'll take a look at that diagram, and what would be the other costs associated with that system? What what else would be there to consider other than shipping, which is included in the delivery price? What other costs do you think are are in there, and which is why we get to five times that amount? Installation and stuff like Yeah. So what makes up that installation? What let's talk. I I really want to go in depth into understanding why that number is so big. Right, so let's get an idea. Many of you have worked in, in companies in co-op terms. Uh, or what other ideas that you have to make you realize that the value is so large? Uh, validation. Validation of the equipment once it's installed. So making sure it does what it's meant to do. Manpower for? Screening and crew the contractors. Okay, to so install. There's also manpower to uh, supervise so supervision of the. Yeah. You probably have to look for the land so flat, and then maybe, maybe this building might not have been there before, so you might have to build it. Flatten land, the building around it. So if we look at this particular instance, 
notice how there is a cascade of reactors and they're on different grade. Right? So <coughs> a higher level that's closer to you and then drops down subsequently. So the land had to be bulldozed and altered first to get, get it to that state. Usually you have some tasks to like the equipment, so like it has to be rebuilt on site, like pressure testing, water testing. Okay, so let's add that into that. Validation and testing of the equipment once it's in. Preventative maintenance, uh, so that's not a fixed capital cost. That would come later as, as one of the other costs in the future once equipment's operating. So we're going to look at that in a, in a class two, uh, next week, actually. Yeah. Uh, PLCs and safety equipment. So PLCs, so instrumentation, let's call it. What safety equipment might there be? Um, depending on what the reactor is, you'd need like explosion proof uh, valves and stuff. Yeah, there'd be all sorts of valves for safety, for venting uh, gases that need to be vented in a pressure, high pressure conditions. All of the like piping to and from the infrastructure for that and the release the infrastructure coming up from Okay, so piping to and from, and that piping is a very general term. There's so many entries under there. You mentioned a few like uh, taking away like sewers, there's air, Air to it, there's water going in, water leaving that needs to be treated. Others? Okay, so it interrupted production, so that's not a capital cost, but it definitely would be a cost that factors into getting it installed, but we won't account for it as a capital cost. Yeah. You just set up like a linear cooling system, would that already be included with the reactor or with whatever? So uh, heating and cooling systems, we would like heat exchanges that you're referring to. Yes, yeah, so like okay. Then whatever like, your reactor created a lot of heat, the cooling Right, so that would be included in the <laughs> cost of the equipment. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what would the downtime of the plant be <coughs> that if it's capital cost, say you're installing the equipment and you have to shut down a certain section of the plant? Yeah. So yeah. So downtime would be not a fixed capital cost. These would come in. The, you would still account for it as a as a eligible cost that you could deduct your cash flow in the future. Yeah. The actual like building modification, like all the catwalks and like maintenance right. and stuff like that. So all the all the catwalks and uh, for people to move around there would be another cost. Yeah. yeah, like on the same way like mezzanines and stuff like that. Kind of like, yeah, like grades, different grading, but on, like to get out. <coughs> Right, so preparing the land and then building these uh, yeah. safe, safe moving areas for people. Yeah, so. um, all those process control Instrumentation, PLC, safety, yeah. So that's good for that. Yeah. Uh, depending on what you're installing, you'll need permits. Permits for installation. So, and power installation supervision. Let's add some. These are now costs that are related to the installation. They definitely factor in. Permits, uh, legal agreements that you have to make. Yeah. Right, so all the rental equipment and manpower. Uh, so, <coughs> so installation equipment itself. Training for the employees would not be in a cap cost, it would be an eligible expense so that comes later on. Yeah, once the equipment's up and running for sure. Okay, so lots there. Uh, some others are health and safety uh, checks that would go into testing. Would the raw material for testing go under the Yeah, that's an interesting one. The raw material you use during testing, so uh, you spend a substantial amount of material just testing and then you end up throwing out, you don't get to sell that stuff. That's a cost that gets rolled in. Um, my prior experience, that's a, that's a lot of money spent on, on that. Because remember, all these reactors are empty, so you have to then fill them up with stuff to do the, this testing and validation. That you, you don't get to sell that afterwards because you're, you're doing unusual plant trials with them, and so you have to then dispose of that material as well afterwards. So those are, those are other costs as well. Okay, so yeah, there's the ladders, the axis, the catwalks. Um, even things like painting. Now you notice all those beautiful yellow catwalks. They weren't yellow originally. That, that's a cost. Insulation for piping. 
So no surprise that by the end of all of this, that that number grows from the cost of it being delivered to about four to five times the original multiple. Why is it higher for fluids processing and for solids processing? that we refer to liquids and gases is at higher pressures and temperatures the sealing required to make sure it doesn't run out. Solids are much easier to manipulate and move around um, and the equipment for it is cheaper. Well, for that you have to account for um, any corrosion on the curve with the piping for that? Absolutely. So the corrosion um, is far more of an issue for fluid processing plants than it is for solids. Okay, so the equipment for solids processing cheaper and easier to uh, than uh, than for fluids processing. So that's that, that difference over there. Okay, so let's take a look now at how we might estimate those delivery costs because we said last uh, sorry the, the cost of the equipment itself because we said last class it's not really right for us to be phoning up our vendors and asking them to do the work for us. How are we able then to estimate the cost of those equipments? So here's the approach we follow. Um, it's a standard approach in all the costing literature. We, we look up the historical cost that someone else has, has spent on this, and then we recognize that their, their cost that they've paid is not going to match our situation. Their cost is going to be for what their capacity was at their time. So maybe their cost of their reactor was for 100 tons per hour. We're going to be processing 150. Okay, so we need to then correct that historical value for some baseline capacity and correct it for our situation's capacity. So that's the first step. Then we're going from that, um, we're going to then also correct for the material of construction. Perhaps the original unit that we have from a historical database was made from carbon steel and we're going to require it in a different alloy. So we're going to correct for the materials of construction. Maybe the original unit was for atmospheric temperature and pressures, and we're operating at higher temperatures, higher pressures, so we're going to correct for that factor as well. And there's the inflation effect as well that we're going to take into account. So then that's going to get, once we correct those historical prices, we're going to get what's called the FOB value, the free on board. What's free on board? Anyone heard this term before in the purchasing aspect? Uh, like the cost without anything else added, so it's, it gets to the factory gate where it's made and then it's your problem. Right, absolutely. So the key point that it's your problem, right? That's FOB, whenever you see a quote given to you FOB, it will be also with a corresponding location. So FOB Vancouver Dock number 26. So this company is going to produce the, the heat exchanger and they're going to drop it off at dock number 26 at Vancouver Port and then it's your business to get it from there to your place. Okay. So the quote is FOB, Osaka, loading dock, and then you pay for insurance and shipping from that point on. So FOB is a, is, a, is a really important concept because it's the trigger or the, the boundary between their responsibility and your responsibility. <coughs> Anything after that, you're taking on the cost of insurance and shipping and damage of that unit so FOB is they're owning the equipment, from FOB onwards you own the equipment. So that's very important from a liability perspective. You need to be very cognizant of that. When you're purchasing equipment, FOB onwards you need to make sure you're covered. If that equipment gets damaged from that, that point onwards, it's your, your problem. Prior to that, uh, it's their problem. So FOB is an important uh, location and it's the cost of it getting to that FOB point that we need to take into account. So then once we have FOB, we can add our labor for materials, installation and shipping and insurance on top of that. From that we're going to get what's called the bare module cost and we'll illustrate that in a minute and then we'll add in some additional terms for contractors fees and other contingencies and then we'll land up with what we call the total cost. This is it the final dollar figure that you actually spend on that unit. 
So here's a great illustration from Dr. Woods' book that shows exactly what's happening here. Here's our heat exchanger on a crate, strapped up at the FOB point. Okay, so the supplier of that heat exchanger just simply puts it on the crate, straps it up and says, here, take care of it from now on. That's your problem. You're then responsible and the costs incurred to get it from there to there. And hook up all the piping, all the connections. Well, first you uncrate it, you unpack it, you inspect it, <coughs> inspect it. Then you hook up all the piping, installation, instrumentation, painting, uh, paying all the engineers and, and contractors for their work. And you create this hypothetical boundary, and that's what's called the bare module. Okay? So that, it's usually a radius of within about three meters. All the piping, instrumentation, valves, and so forth, building the foundation on which this sits, at concrete leveling the ground, pouring the concrete, um, installing sewer and drainage, building the building around it if necessary, those are all added into the bare module cost. And that's what we really want to estimate. So given the price of this guy delivered, we can estimate the price of that guy installed. So there's those costs listed. We've got many of them here in our discussion earlier. So let's take a look at, um, let's not take a look at this. I'll come back at this because this is a good summary of what we're going to do. Um, and it's just messy to walk through this first. Let's come back to this later. Okay. So we're going to look at an equation here that tells us how to calculate the bare module cost. We're going to go look it up in a database. And what we're going to focus on today are these next two terms, the capacity factor and the inflation factor. So the capacity factor is the correction for the fact that when we look up this equipment in the database, it's not at the same capacity <coughs> that we're required. So the database value might be, for example, 100 tons per day. We need it at 150 tons per day. So we added this multiplier. All of these things are multipliers. Notice they're not additions. They're multiplications. We've got to multiply the price by some number to correct the capacity. We're going to multiply by another number. So add, compound to that, this inflation factor. And we will talk about how we estimate those. Then next week we'll talk about uh, the other factors to correct for operating conditions and so forth. So here's, a, here's the idea. If I have the capacity factor for a known piece of equipment B, so that might be, for example, the power required by a pump, so power measured in kilowatts by an existing pump B, I know that I need a pump with a different amount of kilowatts. This is my required pump, my new design. I can ratio those two and raise it to a power N, to, and then I know the cost of the original pump B for a given set of kilowatts B, and I can then estimate my cost A. So what I'm after here is my cost for my situation knowing the cost for a historical device, the factor for a historical <coughs> device, so those two on the denominator, and then the new rate there is what my requirements. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at what we mean by factor first. That's the first uh, important part to understand. When we say factor, what we mean is we want a factor, uh, over this here, we want the factor to be the feature of that unit, the feature related to that capital item, the pump, the distillation column, the heat exchanger. What is the feature of that unit that best correlates and scales with capital cost? Okay, so let's take a look at that in the context of the heat exchanger. So the duty in kilojoules or kilowatts is that a feature? So Pump, uh, heat exchange with higher heat duties um, would then scale with the cost. So the greater the cost, the greater the, the heat duty that can be used in that heat exchanger. Or the surface area of the heat exchanger, so that some of the all, the all the internal areas where the heat exchange is, is occurring. The total number of tubes, might that be a feature of the heat exchanger that best correlates with the cost? So as the number of tubes increases, the cost increases. Or the flow rate in of, say, the heating stream. 
which one of those factors might be at best correlated with the cost? Probably the area. The area makes, uh, makes sense. Heat duty. Well, you could imagine heat exchanges with uh, the heat duty is a function of the heat capacity of the fluid. So when you're buying the heat exchanger, to a minor extent, the fluid really makes no, makes very small impact on the price, right? So heat duty is not going to be related to the cost. Number of tubes, to some extent, okay, but not totally, right? Because if I buy a heat exchanger with ten tubes, it does that the cost. If I make those tubes one meter, or if I make the tubes five meters, I've still got ten tubes, okay, but. So it's not just the tubes, it's also the number of tubes multiplied by the length, which is essentially then back to the area. And so, and then the flow rates also make no, make, have no impact on this design, because if I choose to operate it at low flow rates or high flow rates, the cost of the heat exchange doesn't change. Okay, so area is a feature of the heat exchange that best correlates with the cost and the scale of that cost. So let's, uh, Let's just uh, emphasize that the area is this, but let's take a look at it what it might be for some other units. In other units, for pumps, it's the volumetric flow rate through the pump that's, that's the factor that best correlates with cost or power. Um, either one works. They're interchangeable to a certain extent. For agitators, again, uh, power makes sense. And then for distillation columns, what we'll see, it's not just the diameter of the distillation column, or the, the number of trays or the height of the column, it's actually the product of both of those that scales with the cost. Okay. Now, how do you, it's not required to know or guess what the factor is. Right? The way this, these tables work for us is that you know that you need to buy a heat exchanger. Okay, so when you go look it up in the tables, the tables tell you what the factor is already that scales with cost. Okay, so we don't have to, try and guess what, that it's the area or, or, or assume that it's the area. The tables will tell us what, what the factor is. So what I will have for you for the next assignment and for this section of the course is we'll have a PDF of Dr. Woods' book on the course website, which has multiple pages of various units. And you simply look up the unit you're interested in costing, and it will tell you what the feature is of that unit that you need to find to then do performance calculation. So here's, um, here's an example, actually, I thought to show you. I was just going through, like I said, all these boxes I got from him. This is one example of the sorts of work that he did to get to those tables. Let's understand what's, what he's done here. Uh, this is important to understand why that, that equation is in the form it is. What he's gone and done is he's plotted on logarithmic paper. Um, here's for a, uh, for a distillation column. He's plotted the, the column diameter multiplied by the height. Okay. That's the logarithmic x-axis. And then on the logarithmic y-axis, he's plotted the cost in US dollars. And in this example, it's prices for 316 stainless steel, so that's material construction, in 1979, January. And those prices correlates, the log of the prices correlate with this log x-axis. And the slope of that is the exponent. So if we go back to this equation over here, if I log both sides, I will get a slope of n, and that's what he looks up. And that's what's reported for you in the table. So we will have from the tables two things. We will know the type of factor we need, area in the case of heat exchanges, and we will also get from tables what that value of n is. And we don't have to guess that. That's, that's, that's a different number for different pieces of equipment. Okay. So what do you think would be a reasonable value for n? Greater than 1, less than 1? <coughs> think of it this way. If unit A costs more than unit B, what would the ratios of those factors be? And then what would N need to be? Larger than one. Sorry? Larger than one is again? Yeah. 
think of it um, a heat exchanger that's of 100 meters squared <coughs> and then a heat exchanger of 200 meters squared. Is the heat exchanger of 200 meters squared, so that's the numerator, the heat exchanger of 100 meters squared is the denominator, so 200 divided 100 is 2. So I'm doubling the area of the heat exchanger. Is my cost going to double? Okay, if the cost does double, then n is, e is exactly equal to 1. Or is the cost going to more than double, in which case n is greater than 1, or is the cost going to be less than double? If we double the area of the heat exchanger, what should happen to the price? It should be less than double. Less than double. So n should be less than, less than one. Okay? And that's true for most, most units in a in chemical process, is that that fact that n is less than one. What's the typical value for n? You guys have taken 3G. Know this one? You've heard of the six tenths rule, right? Did Dr. Adams yeah, teach yeah. 3D properly? Okay, so you heard about the six tenths rule? So six tenths is a good, good factor to use over there. And the true range of ends are at the low end it's 0.3, at the high end it's 1.2. So certain units uh, actually don't scale. Uh, and, and get cheaper as they get larger. And so some units will get more and more expensive as they get larger, but for by and large, um, as we double the capacity, we don't pay double the cost, we pay less than double, and so that factor is uh, yeah. a, good, a good rule of thumb if you have absolutely no knowledge is 0.6. But the way we actually use this is uh, we, we use these, device, uh, these tables and, and diagrams of this nature where we're plotting um, log, log of the feature on the x-axis and plot that against log cost on the y and then that slope is equal to n. So you, you should prove that to yourself that if you have two points on this graph a and b <coughs> that the slope is, is equal to n. So that's a straightforward um, feature of that equation over here. Okay. Now, there's, there are some limitations to this. This is called a power law. Um, we're familiar with like, this in terms of like, computing. We know that computing capacity uh, almost doubles every year, and, and the size of these computer chips gets smaller and smaller. But we can imagine that there's a limit to it. right? And it's the same thing over here. There is a limitation on these power laws. And the rough rule of thumb is when these factors start to go more than an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, you're really pushing the boundaries on, on that. Right, so you, it's, you can't say, well, I want a heat exchanger of 100 meters squared and then scale that up to a heat exchanger of 5,000 meters squared and, then, and expect that exponent to last over the entire range. And so the, the, the key point then is not just that n is, is a, a suitable value, but this range on this x-axis here is suitable. Okay? We, we don't expect this slope to keep going and going indefinitely um, at, at a rate of 0.6. So it's quite quite clear that systems further up over here on the on the x-axis, that slope might start to change and get more steep or less steep. Okay? So that 0.6 holds over a limited range. So then the next feature of these correlations I want us to be aware of is when we look up on the table, we not only find the factor, we not only find what n is, but we also find, reported to us, what is a suitable range over which we can use that correlation. That, those three pieces of information are really, really important. So let's, uh, let's actually emphasize that by just writing it down on your notes there. So when we, the first step is to look up the correlation and ensure that we find the factor that is appropriate. And 
and then we find the range also that is valid. <coughs> And there's a fifth feature that we look up, is we look up the error. Okay, so the error will be reported as a percentage range. So we will find, for example, in some tables the error might be plus or minus 20%, and in other <coughs> tables the error will be greater. And so we'll use that at the end when we report our estimates, um, and we'll adjust for that. So let's, uh, let's just do a quick, um, is there any in here? Okay, no. so I'll, I'll come to an example in a minute. Let's take a look at, at the next thing we correct for, and that's the effect of price changing over time. So what we, what we do for that, just to put that in context, is we've estimated our price now. Just come back to the slide. We've looked up our price in the database and then we've corrected for capacity using that formula over there. The next step is to correct for inflation. And the way we do that is by using what are called these indexes. Now there's at least four indexes available. The ones that we will use in this course are the first one and the last one, Marshall and Swift and Chemical Engineering Plant Cost Index. The way these indexes are set up is they take a point in time and they set the index to be 100. So, I, so they take up that point, I think it's in the 1960s for the Marshall and Swift index, that index was 100. And then they take for a typical <coughs> process, and they include the cost of the technology, the cost of labor, and, and all these other costs we've actually been talking about earlier in the class. And they say, well, what would it cost to build a process in that year? And then they take it. Every year they, they get quotes from vendors and they recalculate their index for the current year. What we see then is that that index goes up and up, as we would expect, and we have the value for 2011 on the course website. It's posted in a spreadsheet on the course website. So we have the data all the way back. But what we, what we really are interested in is the ratio. So a process that we built in the 1970s, if we had to rebuild it in 2000, would cost 3.6 times that value. So we're interested in the ratio. And as I said, we'll use the first and the last one. This, this nelson farrer index is only appropriate for petrochemical processes. So it's very, very specific index. The first and the last one are more general. And take into account the fact that uh, technology has improved over the years. So that's an important reason why that those numbers are lower, because we get greater productivity from modern equipment the Nelson Farrer uses technology from its baseline case and, and just keeps extrapolating. But that technology has changed over, over the years, and so those why, that's why the first and the last index are more suitable to our situation. So what we'll do is once we've calculated the cost in the 1970s or the 1980s, 1990s, whenever we get our number from that historical database, we will get that number from the database, say for 1980, and we'll scale it up to current dollars in today's, today's terms. So there's a plot of what those, those indexes have looked like over the years. And they reflect the, the economy by and large. What's interesting is if you calculate the inflation in that index, it's actually much greater than regular inflation. So the cost of building processes and installing equipment has increased at a higher rate than regular consumer price indexes. Okay, so that's why we don't use consumer price indexes, because these are related to food and housing and other other day-to-day -day activities for people, but these indexes here are related to chemical processes and the cost of the equipment. So let's, uh, let's just take a look at an example here for using this index. It's uh, very straightforward. The rule is if we take the cost for our desired unit, and we know the cost of the original unit at a certain point in time. So this might be in the 1980s, for example, A, and we would like it in, in a more up-to-date time frame. Uh, simply take the ratio of the inflation factors. So inflation factor in the current year of B divided by the inflation factor of the original year of A. So that's the rule. 
And if we took an example where cost in 1979, let's say, was 65,690, and the reason why I'm using that example is uh, it's one of the, the data points that um, was used in Dr. Woods' table over here was, uh, was exactly this, in 1979. One of the distillation columns on that graph cost 65,690. How much would it cost in 2011? And we're given that Marshall and Swift in 2011 is 1490. And we're given that Marshall and Swift <coughs> in 1979 is equal to 607. So in 1979, this Marshall and Swift value was 607, just a little bit lower than that. And in 2011, Marshall and Swift has gone up to 1490. So that distillation column in 2011 would cost Inflation factors are a way of taking time value of money into account. Time value of money, though, we would need an interest rate I that is a single value that's appropriate over a period of time. But the reality is that there isn't a single value of time value of money over these stretches of time that will work correctly for us or work accurately for us. So these indexes are a far better way of estimating these inflated costs over time because they take into account the actual cost of equipment and technology over the over the years. Whereas the time value of money at a single interest rate I would at best just be an estimate um, and not not <coughs> for this for this area that we're estimating costs for. Any questions on that? Uh, Okay, so straightforward scaling factor for, for dollar figures. Let's uh, go take a look now at um, at what one of these tables for a heat exchanger correlation will look like. So we'll we'll see more examples of this in the tutorial. So here's a heat exchanger, and what we're interested in is determining the, the cost of this heat exchanger in today's dollars for a given size. And when we look this up, it, it's fairly intimidating at first, so let's unpack what, uh, what Dr. Woods has here in his presentation. There's a, this, these correlations are valid for a number of heat exchanger configurations, and those are, are shown diagrammatically up here. These costs are also for mid-1970 for when Marshall and Swift was 300. So that's, when, the, when we're reading dollar figures on this table, it's referring to this point in time. How can we use this table next is we read that, we know that we'd like a shell and tube heat exchanger, and it's saying that for a floating head 1140 KPA, 
carbon steel with carbon steel shell, bare tubes, delivered cost with standard length of 4.85, either 25 or 1.9 centimeter tubes, oh, sorry, 2.5 or 1.9 centimeters outer diameter OD tubes on square or triangular pitch. So that's the basic heat exchanger that we're looking at. And here's the base cost for it for a given surface area. So 10 to the 2 meters squared. So 100 meters squared is my heat transfer area. Okay, we're given the range for which this correlation is valid. This correlation now is working in units of meters squared. And it's a little bit hard to get used to, and you'll, you'll see this in the table, it's 10 to the 2. So the correlation is actually referring to the 10, and then you're squaring it up. So what we do then is that the range for which we can use this for other heat exchanges is when that ratio is, uh, sorry, when that number is between 0 0.02 to 20. So in other words, this correlation is valid for 0 0.02 when we're putting that in as my index to 20, and then I can I get to square. It. Sorry, I need to I need to rephrase that. This is going to get messy. <laughs> um, it's it's valid for a base a base heat exchanger of 100 meters squared. So where this correlation is valid for is 0.02 to 20. What that refers to is my area divided by 100. Okay. So my new area divided by 100 is the base, base area, and it's valid for that range of factors. So that, that correlates to a 2 meter square heat exchanger to So that's how we check the validity of our, of our heat exchange. So take my desired area, ratio it to the base area, and as long as I'm within that range, I can use this correlation. The next uh, feature that we read off is N, which is this exponent column over here. So for heat exchanges, N is a number of 0.71, and then the error associated with that heat exchanger is 40% when we finally finish our calculations. We've got to tack on an error of, of uh, 40%. So, and then this column that I jumped over is probably what we really want to start off with, and that's the $8,000 figure. So 8 to the power $3, so 8 times 10 to the $3 is what a heat exchanger in 1970 is going to cost for those basic conditions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take my heat exchanger area and I'm going to then use those capacity factors. So let's take a look at that. So here is this example over here. I would like to estimate the cost for a heat exchanger of 70 meters squared and I will just state for now that all these conditions match the conditions of that existing heat exchanger in the table. So really the only difference between my heat exchanger that I would like versus the one in the table is that mine is 70 meters squared versus the base case in the table of 100 meters squared. Okay. So the first step is to then get that capacity factor ratio. I put in 70 over 100, I get 0.7, and 0.7 lies between those two bounds, so I'm good to go with this correlation. That's the first step to check. Then the next step is to then do the, do the capacity inflation. So we're saying cost B divided by cost A is back to B divided by factor A to the N. So what we know is that our cost B in 1970 is going to equal cost A in 1970. And then we multiply 
multiplied by this capacity factor of my heat exchanger being 70 meters squared divided by 100 raised to the power n of 0.71. That's equal to $8,000 multiplied by 0.7. Okay, so we can then go calculate that cost in 1970. The next step then, which we'll we'll take up in the tutorial with some examples, is we then take the cost in 1970 and we inflate it to the current day value that we require. So it's a two-step process done by these multipliers. The first multiplier is to inflate for capacity. Then we're going to add another multiplier on here to inflate for price and time. So we'll see how that's done. Um, in the tutorial on Monday, we'll have multiple steps to show this process.